Thank you. Good evening. And what an evening it's been. Do you ever have just a far out crazy idea? Now imagine that you work at a place where those ideas are the tame ones. I grew up as a boy in Sweden and as a teenager, if somebody would have told me that one day I'll be working for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a chief technology and innovation officer in IT, I would have called that utterly crazy. Now imagine that those ideas come from an 80 year old that just keeps getting not crazier and crazier. So what are some of the ideas? Well, going to space for one thing, going to outer space beyond our solar system that Voyager is now is one of those. One more that I want to set the stage for a little bit. Imagine that you have worked day and night passionately for well over a decade on one thing and one thing alone. It's coming to a head. It's going to be do or die in the next few minutes. Let's take a look at this from a human perspective and relive what happened a few years ago. Now that is why I work at JPL. Every time I see that, is it going to work this time? Is it going to work? <laughs> so my message today uh, that I just goofed up somehow uh, is that I, I work in IT. You think of the IT department as some backroom people. Let me tell you it's not. IT is intensely personal. And as you saw here today, it's about enabling a mission. It's about working together. IT is no longer information technology. It's innovating together. And that's the progress that I want to talk a little bit about. We're going to talk about a progression of JPL, where we are from today, and we're going to take a leap into 2025. That is three IT decades. So what's an IT decade? It's the next three years. Turns out there's a generation gap in IT between a freshman in college and a senior in college. And if you have it, put them to the test. So the current decade is about social, mobile, analytics, cloud, and something we call key disruptors. We'll talk a little bit about each of those, but when we find something that is there in any of those areas, we prototype, we try it, we look for those moments of engagement, and that's worthy. Now you can get that personal involvement and the energy that you're looking for. What's a disruptor? A disruptor it can be a negative word, but it doesn't have to be. 
If you see it coming, an IT disruptor, and you can get there first, you can get a competitive advantage if you're private business, or you can get that energy and enthusiasm and take advantage of what's coming from industry. This used to be a disruptor. You used to go to the computer room to do IT. That happens to be the Johnson Space Flight Center. You, uh, this is another disruptor in the 80s. Uh, that's when I entered the workforce. You could now go to your room and do computing. Nowadays, you can go to any room and do computing, thanks to the internet, the giant disruptor. A future disruptor is the internet of things. So that's where it's headed, but everything is connected and uh, we are all sensors and that's what the excitement will build around. So let's talk about some of these. The crowd. Uh, has anybody been to a hackathon? A uh, few of you are raising your hands. Uh, we do. We go to hackathons, we sponsor them to be able to do, get citizen scientists to get excited about space and to help us. And indeed they can. This is the results of a one day hackathon in Las Vegas where the students took satellites from five satellites, data from five satellites and visualized the moisture content from the, across the earth in seven months. And they did that in a day. We learned that we need to provide the data in a way that they can use, not in the way that we are used to loving. Now, what about collaboration and being mobile? What does that mean? Of course, it means mobile apps. So we wrote mobile apps and we found that you all liked it. You liked staying in touch. You were able to take out your smartphone and see what's going on in space. The scientists did too. They preferred the smartphones over the specialized IT that we had given them, so that was a big clue. It's about being personally engaged. This is another type of collaboration from remote. Let's take a look. Two JPL robots getting together. These are telepresence robots. The people are sitting thousands of miles away driving them. Yet they are participating. And we'll listen in for a second. Let's turn them down for a little bit and uh, you'll see them dry off, drive off to meetings and to participate. We found that this was very, it started like a gimmick, a moment of engagement, and we found that it was very effective. In fact, for the LDSD mission, the flying saucers you may have heard of, people, scientists from across the world dialed in and were able to drive around and participate at JPL in the meetings without travel. Huge disruptor and a wonderful one. This is from NASA, how we used to collaborate. Uh, some we still do, but how do you do that in a clean room? How do you do that so that you don't have to have printers in a clean room? Well, up to a year ago, we did. So then what we did is we introduced this uh, large touch screen where they could edit the drawings, and it was a huge disruptor, wonderful one. Yeah, then we added Google Glass, like this and let's listen into here. the world expert, Bill Happen Allen, uh, world-renowned designer of spacecraft. Clearance issues. What we have here is a drawing, so I can move from the drawing environment to the model environment. So what you're actually doing is you're hearing the world's expert through his eyes, hands-free, uh, talking about what he did. Is that a great training video? Absolutely. So we worked with Microsoft and we built uh, a way of automatically transcribing the words that were spoken. So those now go up automatically to our JPL tube. It's an internal YouTube. And people who need it can search for the training and get uh, trained automatically, uh, for, uh, essentially for free. Those are the disruptors that IT can generate. Now what about a, a disruptor, 3D printing? Uh, two years ago, if I'd said that, you would have said, nah, no big deal. Nowadays, 3D printing it was a huge disruptor and a wonderful one in that became so inexpensive. What we were able to do is to, you, we have something we call an IT petting zoo. And the IT petting zoo is so that the scientists and engineers can try the new IT and give us feedback. So here, they were able to use these inexpensive printers and it made brainstorming uh, explode. It was uh, uh, an amazing uh, energy that was released. And it went so far as to being able to, the rover saw a uh, meteorite on Mars. And uh, Chris Caprero was able to take a look at this, print it, create the model and print it. And now you can all hold in your hands the copy, exact copy of the meteorite on Mars. And it also has Braille on the bottom so that the blind can participate. Uh, all for the cost of about a eh, dollar. So 
it makes, and this is the life-size one that we also printed, on inexpensive 3D printer and just stitched it together. This is uh, Andy Clash. Andy Clash is uh, one of the innovators of new small spacecraft we call CubeSats. 3D printed many different models, was able to look at them, and then as the progression happens, he was able to print it in metal. So that was 30 times cheaper, 30 times faster, but it also creates new capabilities in space that we never had before, because if you made two metals, you have a weakness. So all of a sudden, we're able to do many new things by starting with this inexpensive uh, moment of engagement of 3D printing and then progressing farther. This, you can see it being measured, so we just strapped it up with uh, inexpensive compute equipment to see how it performed. Now, JPL's motto is dare mighty things. And if you can see, IT is all over that, smack in the middle. So what about cloud, thank you. What, is, what about cloud and data analytics? Those were key disruptors. We are currently eating data through a straw, drinking data through a straw. It's radio frequency. We has gone up, but when we go to laser con, it's like having a fiber optic into space. And we did. We put one on the space station and we were able to get data faster than you can get data, internet data at home. So all of a sudden, that enables new missions. This is our proud uh, family portrait. You see the mail -sized, uh, mailbox sized rover. You see the uh, dune buggy sized rover. And then you see Curiosity. It's uh, 2,000 pounds, the size of a Mini Cooper. And Dan Isla in the middle there, posing proudly. Dan uh, is key uh, because he was, I'm gonna show in a second about some analytics that he did. The challenge, the crazy thing about Curiosity was landing 2,000 pounds, 150 million miles away, completely automated. That is nuts. So, as you saw earlier, it worked. But what you didn't see was us using cloud computing to deliver the message to you. So you all could see it at the same time we did. Now, this was our Super Bowl. This was our Olympics. It either worked or it didn't work. And you're super interested for a couple of hours, and then it dies down. So by using cloud computing, we were able to deliver these amazing numbers, uh, 150 gigabit per second, 80,000 requests per second, and 150 terabytes in just a few hours. We could not do that alone. So in this case, we partnered with Amazon and used their cloud, and we were able to deliver all the data, and it was 100 to 1,000 times less expensive than nine years prior when we didn't have cloud computing. So that's where this experiment in cloud computing that we had done paid off. And this is the first selfie from another planet. It's a selfie to make sure I'm healthy. And that was uh, Curiosity. Now, what is this? This is Curiosity. And it is something called augmented reality. And augmented reality is a huge disruptor for the future and a really fun thing. If you have an Android or a smartphone, pick up one of these cards on your way out. Uh, as you walk out, they'll hand them to you. And then you can participate directly in our space mission um, and see in 16 other instruments as well. And that Martian that came to visit when I put this on the pool deck looks like a, a golden retriever, but it's not. It's actually a real Martian. So big data. Could anything be more impersonal and boring than big data? Not really. It, it's really about the questions you ask about the big data. It's intensely personal. And here is one question. Curiosity again, our old friend. Turns out it's cold on Mars. And what you're seeing there is you're seeing the highs and lows of temperature uh, within that range the instruments can operate. The way they did that was to take a PowerPoint, email that PowerPoint out to people, and they would then, the experts, would analyze if it worked. Was there a better way? We had a passionate developer and a passionate uh, operator, a driver, and Gordy and Dan, and they were able to figure out a better way. So here's the better way. Instead of looking at one telemetry channel at a time, look at all of them. And instead of looking at PowerPoints, look at them the way you'd look on a stock market, where you look compare stock to each other. Use the same ideas. You can look at many at the same time, and what you're seeing here is data that is two and a half years uh, all at their fingertips. And it's about one billion data points. They can look then at one instrument. They can look at another. And they can uh, then the magic 
can come as they look at those highs and lows, and they may find something that they're interested in, which they always do. Now they can click on that data point, and they're able to say, I need some extra help. And instead of sending a PowerPoint, they take this exact situation and send that URL, or that uh, link, to somebody else who may be on the beach, no longer strapped into the data center, and can now continue the analysis. As they, as they really go deeper, they are able to click on that point, any one of those billion points, and see the messages that the rover generated. There's 26 million messages. They used to have to go through them by hand. Now they can search for it, look back, and see if there was a similar one that happened before. And they can see the pictures that the, uh, that the uh, cameras took at the same time. All of a sudden, instead of the operator and the analysts being at the mercy of the data, data is at their fingertips. And they can use it anytime, at any point they want. So it's intensely personal. Now, here is what they used. I'm the chief technology officer for IT. I didn't have a clue about this. So part of the magic is the next generation, uh, students at Cal Poly Pomona and others, is to enable them to use the technology they will want to use. And we use the cloud to do that so that they can quickly experiment. Then one of our executives said, could you use the same technique on a spacecraft that hasn't flown yet? So uh, turns out that SMAP, uh, Soil Moisture Active Passive Instrument, was in test phase. So we're able to collect 3.8 data, billion data points on that. And as it launched, it actually helped save the launch because we saw an anomaly that we could then, in uh, seconds, see that that was normal and it was okay to launch. It now has over 4 billion data points and it's all at their fingertips, thanks to analytics. Another question, and this is actually a video uh, by Cal Poly alumni. Uh, we wanted to see augmented reality. What could we possibly do? So if we can turn up the volume just a little bit. Uh, this is a student of the future, and uh, what he is doing is writing a paper. Actually, this is a Cal Poly alumni. And uh, so we use Google Glass, because that's what we have. OK, Glass, go to Mars. And so now, instead of having just flat pictures of Mars, since we put the picture, of, uh, of the landing for you all to see of, at the time it happened. We had them in the cloud already, so it was very straightforward to progress to put them into something like Google Glass or my Pebble smartwatch or all okay, smart Show me curiosity. Now this student wants to go deeper, so now he brings up that augmented reality that he's seeing It's seeing it through his glasses, and he's able to look at the Curiosity rover and see how it works. Uh, move the arms, etc. But he wants to go even deeper. He wants to actually stand on the surface of Mars and experience the wonders of it. So now we have a panorama of the pic real pictures from Mars that you're seeing that he can see through Google Glass or you can see through your smartphones. Uh, this particular technology is so powerful that a book has actually been uh, written and then augmented. If you have a smartphone and you read this book, you can now see the spacecraft that took the pictures. So it's an interactive book. So we think that's the future of education. The uh, Enter this. Anybody know what this is? It's Microsoft HoloLens. Microsoft HoloLens takes this, gen this uh, idea of augmented reality and immersive reality to the next level. And that's what's going to happen in IT. So for us, it's trying to get the excitement, the use case, so when that leap happens, we're able to participate. And if you uh, go to YouTube, and look at uh, Microsoft HoloLens and JPL, and you can see that in July, our operators will actually be using these and virtually be on Mars, and it's going to be a wonderful thing. Uh, my friend Jeff Norris at JPL led this effort. So what will it look like in 2025? Here's my prediction, and will I be right? It doesn't matter that much. What matters is that we're progressing in the right direction. We'll have 3D printing being mainstream, working from anywhere it's expected, especially with something like the HoloLens. Uh, one of the key things here is that most, J with JPL is about 5,000 people. More than half of them will be millennials, used to work a different way. And uh, it's, IT is gonna be key to both personal and, and uh, enterprise productivity, and that's about that energy, that excitement. It's about the progression. We will be visiting uh, Europa, if everything goes well. Europa is a moon of Jupiter that is very most likely to house life. We will also, hopefully, uh, go capture an asteroid. An asteroid so that if a really big asteroid comes at us, we have studied and we, knows, we know how to uh, divert it. Hopefully, we'll be well on our way to send humans to Mars. 
And how does 3D printing help that? Well, this is, uh, Bill Allen again has designed this uh, to be able to have a Mars sample return. So you collect it, you put it in here, you wait for a couple of years. Then another spacecraft come, picks it up and shoots it up to another spacecraft that sends it to Earth. Crazy stuff? Yes, so was the sky crane. Uh, the next version of this, so that's probably about $5 worth of material. The next version is this one where the samples are inside and it is a heat shield so itse itself can be launched. So it's, uh, the progression is fantastic and it's really amazing. So you come visit JPL in 10 years and it's gonna look exactly the same <laughs> on the outside. On the inside, it'll be this crazy startup with new crazy ideas. It'll be innovating together. Projects will be done in months, not years. And uh, it will be a wonderful place and we hope that many of the students will then be working at JPL and NASA. And this progression, it may sound crazy. To us, it's progress. Thank you very much.